Very first thing before I welcome you all here, I want to point out to our YouTube audience, I'm sorry we have a technical glitch and the stream of the PowerPoint is not going to show. So all you'll be seeing today is our speaker. So my apologies for that. Um, otherwise, I'd like to welcome you all here today to the Foley Institute. I'm not going to spend much time here at all except to encourage you to subscribe to our YouTube channel and hopefully it will work properly in the future. And also like and follow us on social media. Um, and what I'm going to do now is to introduce our speaker. I'd like to welcome the uh, Provost of WSU and WSU and Pullman's Chancellor, Elizabeth Chilton. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Hello. Welcome. Um, so glad to see so many people here. It's better to have standing room only, I guess, than uh, to try to get a midday uh, lunch together that's not well attended. So. Thank you, Richard, for the introduction and for hosting today. Um, it's really a special honor to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Jason De Leon. I've known Jason for a number of years as a fellow anthropologist and archaeologist, and we've worked together over the years in various uh, national leadership in leadership positions in national organizations for archaeology and anthropology. And I can, can't tell you how thrilled I am to have him visit here at WSU and inspire such an extraordinary series of campus and WSU system-wide engagements and activities uh, really throughout the past eight months and throughout the day today during his visit. I hope you will join us for the reception later at the Art Museum. Uh, so by way of introduction for our speaker, Dr. De Leon holds a professorship in the Department of Anthropology and Chicano Chicano Studies at UCLA, having previously held faculty positions at the University of Michigan. He is the author of the award-winning book, The Land of Open Graves, Living and Dying on the Migrant Trail, and he's a recipient of the five-year MacArthur Foundation Fellowship in 2017. He's also the recipient of numerous other awards and honors, and one that I'm particularly jealous of is the Margaret Mead Award from the American Anthropological Association in 2016. Dr. De Leon serves as the executive director of the Undocumented Migration Project and the Calibri Center for Human Rights, which is a research, arts, and education collective that is focused on raising awareness about issues related to migration and assisting families of missing migrants. So today's le lecture, as you know, will uh, address the politics of migrant death in Arizona and describe the ongoing global exhibit, Hostel 394, or HT94, that seeks to raise awareness about the issue and highlight the new collaboration between the Undocumented Migration Project and the Calibri Center for Human Rights. WSU is proud to be one of the more than 120 institutions across six continents that have hosted Hostile Terrain 94. The participatory exhibit, uh, for those of you, how many of you in the room engaged with the exhibit? Um, quite a few. So I don't need, most of you I don't need to tell you, but for those who haven't, it's a participatory exhibit that's made up of more than 3,800 handwritten toe tags that represent migrants who have died trying to cross the Sonoran Desert between the mid uh, in a, from the mid-1990s uh, through 2021. And these tags are geolocated on the wall in our art museum on a map found, um, and our members of our campus community have been, over the past several months, have been uh, taking part in the physical writing of the tags and the names and information for each one of these individuals. And if you haven't had the opportunity to do so, I encourage you to go to the Jordan Snitzer Museum of Art, um, where you will find this exhibit on display through March 11th. Um, and so please, uh, with that, join me in welcoming Dr. Jason De Leon. Thank you so much for that very generous uh, introduction and for having me um, here on campus. It's a real honor and privilege to be here. Um, and it's always just really um, amazing for me to, to watch um, the exhibition happen from a distance. And, um, and it's even more of a treat when I actually get to physically come and, and, and engage with students who have worked on it and, and staff and faculty. And so um, thank you so much. Um, before I dive into my, my PowerPoint, I think I've just been increasingly thinking about the movie Children of Men, which is based on the, the book um, by um, the, the same name, um, it's a sort of this future dystopia um, where 
uh, the U or human fertility has stopped. Um, people, humans have become have become infertile, and it's it's led to this global migration crisis that's that's happening. And I'm just going to show a quick little um, a quick little clip here. Clive Owen on a on a on a train. There are there are migrants on the train tracks who cannot get into into Britain, who are who are sort of rioting. And when I first saw that movie many years ago, it it, it seemed quite quite far away. And I feel like increasingly, um, it's it's really starting starting to mirror um, our our American reality in in a lot of ways. And so this is from um, a footage from Tijuana from a few years ago, when a Central American. Uh, uh, Caravan was was headed to the wards of the United States and was pushed back both by by Mexico at the behest of the United States as well as um, as by um, U.S. immigration agents. <laughs> And I show this. Oh. So as you look at what's marching up, that's an invasion. That's not, that's an invasion. I show this because I believe that this is, this is both our, our, our current reality and it's, it's a preview into what it's going to look like uh, into, the, into the future. And... And I want us to be, we're going to be talking about Arizona today, but I want to keep us thinking about this uh, migration as a global crisis that we are sort of experiencing um, and that the lessons we can learn from Arizona can be expanded to uh, around the globe. And uh, I think like many people, I was quite optimistic when, um, when we had a change in, um, um, in, in presidents in, in the last couple of years that we were somehow pushing towards um, a, a better moment um, uh, regarding immigration reform. And unfortunately, that has not been the case. Um, you know, in a, in a very high profile visit to Central America, Vice President Kamala Harris stood in front of a bunch of reporters in Guatemala and told all of Central America to not come to the United States. And I was asked right after this um, press conference what I thought about this statement. And my response was simple. If telling people do not come to the United States actually worked, we would have said this a long time ago. And I just find this to be a really um, uh, just naive, if not foolish, sort of take on, on, this, on this problem that we are going to be in increasingly facing as we move forward um, in, in, into the future. And, and we have to keep in mind that when we talk people do, do not come, we're talking about places like Honduras, El Salvador, Guatemala, Haiti, um, Venezuela, you know, the poorest countries in the Western Hemisphere, and now increasingly people coming from Africa and elsewhere who are... Um, who are seeking a better life. We're telling people not to come, but they live in, in, in places with some of the highest murder rates in the world. So thinking about, um, you know, especially places like, like Honduras and Mexico, um, <coughs> the Dominican Republic, others, other places where these folks are, are literally running for their lives. And so telling them do not come um, really is telling them to stay home and, and, and face death. But also more importantly, we need to think about what is happening in regards to climate change. 10 years ago, when I said migration and climate change are related, people would snicker. And increasingly, I think it is hard to avoid that connection. And we are watching this thing unfold in real time. We, we, we watch people stand on their roofs in a place like Honduras. And as soon as the water recedes from back-to-back -back super hurricanes, they immediately start leaving that country because they, can, they, they, cannot make, um, uh, they cannot survive in those locations. And probably the biggest kicker about this whole thing is that, you know, Disproportionately, the global south 
is experiencing the, the impacts of climate change despite the fact that it's the global north that are the, the drivers of these things. And so we've made Honduras unlivable um, because of political meddling, because of economic exploitation, and now because of, because of um, uh, uh, the, the West fueling uh, climate change. Um, we could think about um, similar examples in, in Mexico and elsewhere. And so these things, this is like a, 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 um, a, a boiling pot of all of these um, terrible factors that are pushing people out of their homes. And it used to be that we were, we were only concerned about the U.S.-Mexico border. But now, of course, you know, the, the stories coming out of places like Central America, like Southern Panama, folks crossing the Darien Gap, um, and the brutality of those experiences are just signaling um, to, to people that the migration process is not at the U.S.-Mexico border only. It extends for months, if not years, far into, in, into South America, into Africa. I mean, you, you can create these, these big um, maps of circulation that show that just how long um, this, this process is and how, and how brutal it is for folks. Um, and I've just completed a, a book on human smuggling across Mexico, um, which really deals with the relationship between smuggling, um, uh, organized crime, um, federal policies um, by the, the uh, U.S. and Mexican governments that are trying to crack down on migration and how that leads to um, increased levels of violence, which I won't talk to you about much today, but I'm happy to, to talk about if we have time for Q&A. Um, so things are bad all around, and, and they're not going to get any better, unfortunately, at least not at, at um, the pace in which we are trying to address these issues um, or largely ignore them. And of course, the, the promise of, of a kinder, gentler administration has not been the case. We are finding new ways to brutalize migrants and to make um, legally um, uh, people following the, the letter of the law, asking for asylum. We're trying to find ways to make their lives as miserable as possible. And, and in hopes that if we ignore them or, um, or try to brutalize them with, these, with particular policies, that this problem will just go away. But that, in fact, is, it's not going to go away. And we're only now starting to understand the other horrible things that are, that are coming out of this migration crisis, um, including this recent expose on, on child labor um, in the United States. And so um, I've had to stop eating Cheerios in my house, much to the chagrin of my kids, because there are kids now making, you know, boxing, boxing Cheerios and making um, uh, granola bars and other kinds of things, but hiding it in, in plain sight. Um, and, um, you know, I, I, we just need to keep all of this in the back of our mind as we're, as we're thinking about what's going on in Arizona and how this relates to, to what's happening um, around the globe. And so to today, just to give us a, a little bit of architecture um, for the talk, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to um, pull mostly from my first book, The Land of Open Graves, <coughs> partly because, it, because HT94 is here and this is what most directly relates to, um, uh, to that exhibition. But like I said, I've just finished a seven-year project on, on human smuggling and looking at this from the other, from the other um, side of the equation and, and how um, you know, things like capitalism um, the need for, for, for safe movements um, and organized crime are all working together to, um, uh, to, to both complicate the lives of migrants, but also to make it more difficult and more um, uh, migration more difficult and more expensive. What I want to talk about today primarily is this policy that we call prevention through deterrence. So I'm going to give you a little bit of background on that. I'm going to talk about the violence that people experience, especially the, the post-mortem violence of prevention through deterrence. And if you walk away from this talk with, any, with anything um, useful, I hope it's just a few key points. Number one, that we don't need a, a big giant border wall, um, despite the fact that we keep talking about it, and it just seems to be such a ridiculous conversation. We have one. We have the, we have the, the desert. We have the, the backwoods of South Texas. We are now increasingly have all of Mexico as a border wall to slow down Central American migrants. And people are dying in Mexico. They're dying at the U.S.-Mexico border. And these deaths are not unintended consequences. These deaths are purposeful. These deaths are strategic. These deaths are not, it's not collateral damage, but it's actually part of this policy. It's, it's death by design. And I think, um, I, and I want us to think about the deaths that happen at the U.S.-Mexico border. It, the violence doesn't stop there. It happens there and it, exp and, it, and it reverberates out to the lives of folks in the United States and elsewhere who were waiting for those family members to arrive. And, and of course, the families and the communities in the sending, in these, um, sending communities where folks are, are leaving from. Those deaths that happen in Arizona extend far, um, far and wide and are, um, are both political and incredibly violent. The work that I'm going to talk about today comes from the Undocumented Migration Project, which is a, a, a research arts education um, collective nonprofit that I've been directing since 2008. Um, 
it's a I draw I freely steal from every discipline that I can in, 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 in an attempt to better understand the process of undocumented migration. And so it's a mix of ethnography, forensic science, archaeology, visual anthropology, um, mu museum work, um, a whole bunch of things, in, in, uh, all as an attempt to, um, to improve our understanding about, this, about the process of migration. And since, um, since 2021, uh, we've legally in incorporated the Colibri Center for Human Rights um, don't be fooled by the Center for Human Rights. Ask, we're not a we're like three people in Arizona who share a tiny little office. Um, but apparently, prior to my time, the funding agency wanted to include that as the title, which makes everyone think that we're this powerhouse, and um, mm -hmm. we're definitely not. But I'm happy to talk more about that in a minute. But the work with Colibri, I feel deeply passionate about, and I'm going to talk about some of it today. Um, but we work to help families of missing migrants, to, to identify people and to repatriate those bodies back to back to their communities. And so, so now the, the Undocumented Migration Project, we do a mix of things. We do research, arts, but we also do direct direct service and outreach. And so, um, you know, to, to get us up to speed, I think we have to first understand that undocumented migration to the United States for the longest time was super visible. Like that scene that we saw of this caravan you know, rushing towards San Diego to San the port of entry in San Ysidro, um, it used to look like that on a daily basis. And the Border Patrol would be overwhelming. People would hop the fence and they could only catch a small number of folks and people would, would sort of get, get around and, um, and, and then be, be removed in vehicles. Um, starting in the, in the mid-90s, there was this big pushback against the, the public visibility of migration. And the Border Patrol was getting a lot of slack from, um, a lot of flack from, um, from politicians, from their constituents. And so the idea was, how do we make, how do we stop migration from happening in a place like San Diego where we can see it on a daily basis? So what they did was they fortified these urban ports of entry, San Diego, El Paso, with the idea that you could no longer hop the fence there. It'd be an impossibility. And you still can't hop the fence in San Diego and, and get through. By putting all this infrastructure there, people then decided, well, we can just walk seven or eight miles or drive seven or eight miles um, east or west in the case of San Diego, driving east, the fence drops off. You walk around. You're back in the United States, but now you have to you have to walk farther to get to where you're going. But at least it's out of it's out of sight, um, and potentially um, uh, they recognize that there was a way to then start to uh, utilize the natural environment um, as a form of, as a as a natural impediment to movement. And so they started fortifying these urban zones um, under this this policy called prevention through deterrence, which began in 1994. And this policy, which is our current security paradigm, this is what we do on a daily basis now. Um, we've been doing it for more than 30 years officially. It's happening in a lot of other places around the globe as well. It's based on, on, on just on two simple things. The first thing is that the U.S.-Mexico border cuts across a bunch of like rugged terrain, so deserts, mountains, you know, rivers. Um, and so the, you, know, you couldn't build a border wall along the U.S.-Mexico border because the environment is so rugged. But more importantly, if people are pushed away from these urban zones like San Diego or El Paso, you can push them towards these more remote areas where then suddenly the Border Patrol has a tactical advantage. And the idea here, in, you know, how it is read, if you disrupt these traditional routes, you can force people over, quote, more hostile terrain. And the idea is that then the terrain itself becomes an impediment to movement. And this, like I said, is what we've been doing for a very, very long time. And when we started doing this in the 1990s, we basically shut off a bunch of places in Texas and California, and then we left the back door of Arizona open. These labels just represent Border Patrol um, um, sectors. Um, and so the Tucson sector, which includes um, multiple, you know, Pima and Santa Cruz County, historically had maybe 15 or 20,000 people migrating, being caught through there in a given year, because nobody wanted to walk across this vast desert. This policy goes into place, we, we shut off these, these areas in red, and then suddenly, um, we start funneling purposefully hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people a year through this area. So you go from like 20,000 people being caught in, in Tucson, the Tucson sector in a given year, to 600,000 in a given year. Um, so a complete, it's, they call it the funnel effect. We, we funnel them through this area. And if you go to southern Arizona today, this is near the port of entry called Sassabee. This is about two and a half miles, three miles from the, the official port of entry. The border wall just stops. And you can just walk around that. And there is nobody there waiting to catch you. Um, I mean, you'll trigger a sensor, and they'll, they'll eventually start to pursue you, but not with any kind of um, um, you know, enthusiasm. 
Because I know that you, you're in the United States, but who cares? You now have to walk, you know, dozens of miles across across the desert to get where you're going. And so the idea is instead of a vertical border wall, which is expensive to maintain and, and you know, people can hop right over it. And there's all kinds of reasons why not why the, that, it's not going to work. Let's just use a, a, a horizontal wall. Let's use the, um, the, the desert itself as a way to slow down, slow down movement. And so we did this in the mid 90s. Um, and migrant death in the mid 90s was relatively low. Um, you know, you would have maybe three or four dozen people tops across the entire length of the border dying in any given year to suddenly this policy goes into place in life at the value of people from from um, coming from other places is that we we don't value those lives. It's, they're expendable for the cost of doing of doing security business. Um, and so a, a, a huge chunk of this work is to, um, is to is to undermine that and to make us remember that these are, in fact, people. Um, um, human beings just like us, and so hostile terrain '94 um, was one of these one of these attempts to to make that map um, uh, perhaps more meaningful for the general public. This project started um, probably around 2018, um, where I had been trying to I was trying to visualize that map in a different way, and um, we created these toe tags. We made orange ones for unidentified remains and Manila ones for um, the people who had been identified. And I wanted to mount a, a, a big paper version of that, that red dot map. I started asking my students at the time at University of Michigan to fill out tags. And all of my students, as they were doing it, started really reflecting on the difficulties of just even writing out the names of the dead and the way in which they were, they were being impacted by something as simple as um, a familiar first or last name. Some of you, you know, I know someone with that name. Or looking at the date that someone was recovered and going, what was I doing on that date? Or that was my birthday? Or hitting people, it was making them think about these, this loss, loss of life in different kinds of ways. And that got me thinking, well, if it's, if it's impacting us in this kind of meaningful way, is this something that we can, we can share with the public? Can we get people to engage with this in, 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 in their own way as a way to learn, as a way to memorialize, as a way to, um, to document and remember that these things are happening um, on a daily basis? And so we launched Prevention Through Deterrence in, um, in 2019. And it, it's, um, you know, we were, we were going to do 150 shows in six months. And then, of course, the, the pandemic happened and we were significantly delayed. Um, and we started picking up steam again um, probably about, about, about two years ago. And, yeah, we're, we're at about the 100 mark for installed exhibitions, including, including one here um, uh, in, in Pullman. I'm trying to think if we've done other, um, you know, we've done one in, at least one, in, if not two, in, C in Seattle, the UW. Um, we did one at the University of Portland, so we've, we've, we've had a little bit of, um, of a Pacific Northwest presence, but, you know, this, this show has been happening in a lot of places, and it's been really um, amazing for me and for our team to see this thing kind of take off, um, even when we weren't, we weren't there to kind of help, help it along, you know, um, in, in person. Here, I'll just to give you a sense of what it looks like, here is a, a clip from Mississippi State in Starksville. This is a show from last uh, last year, where people are filling out the toe tags. They're um, they've mounted a grid on a map of the Arizona border, and then they're they're putting those those tags in the exact location of where uh, where those individuals were found. Um, and those of you that have worked on this, you know, understand this is a really this is a labor of love. It takes a lot of work to do this. Um, and but I think it's I think it's worth it. I'm, you know, as I was saying to to, um, to folks earlier today, it's not so much the, the finished product, but it's really the the process of just being present for a little bit and and, and thinking about these individuals. Um, and for me, it's taking this map, this two dimensional um, digital map, and trying to make it into something living and breathing, and a reminder that these are these are human lives represented on the, on this um, on this map. Uh, so th thank you um, for all of the work that you've done um, to make this happen here. Uh, if you're interested, you know, this is happening in a lot of other places. Um, if you check our website, you can, you can see um, other ongoing shows. Um, if you know someone that is interested in hosting this also, it's, it's, um, it's relatively easy for us to get you the kit. It's a lot of work to, to build it, um, but we're always happy to work with, with, with any group that is interested in, um, in helping raise awareness about this issue. Um, and I think... Uh, yeah, we've got, there's probably 15 or 20 shows happening right now. And then um, I think into the fall, another 15 or 20. And it just keeps, um, I, we'll eclipse the 150 mark probably by the end of, by the end of next year, um, uh, I think. 
So all that being said, I wanted to give you some context for what we're going to look at now, which is what's happening on the ground in, in Arizona. And I think probably the best way to start is just to give you a sense of what it looks like for migrants who have to go through this, this rugged um, terrain to get where they're, where they're going. Uh, this is a photo of, of two men uh, that I call Memo and Lucho, who I wrote about in my, in my first book, and um, a couple of uh, people who I became close with um, during um, this project in Arizona, who on their last crossing attempt photographed their journey with disposable cameras and have graciously allowed me to, um, to use their, their images to help um, talk about these experiences. Memo and Lucho would say, if you're going to cross the U.S.-Mexico border through the Sonora Desert, you typically start in a town called Altar, which is a, a, a trucking hub and also a, a primary corridor for, for drug and human smuggling. I mean, so much to the point that the local baseball team are called the Coyotes of Altar, which in Spanish is a, a euphemism for human smuggler. So everybody in there in this town is sort of in on the joke that there's a lot of commerce happening through here that revolves around um, um, the, the smuggling market. And so you would start in Altar and you work your way towards the desert. You get dropped off, you know, just just probably north of, of Nogales on the Mexican side. And you, you will try to basically walk through the corridor that includes the town of Aravaca and get all the way up to, um, to Tucson. And in some cases, people are walking all the way to, to a place like Phoenix, which is, um, you know, well over 130 miles from, from the border. And they're doing this on foot. All right? They're doing it all year long, but, um, we're, but we're, people are dying at the highest rates during, this, during the, um, the summer from extreme heat and lack of water. But they're also freezing to death in the winter. They're drowning during the monsoon seasons. You know, they are walking across this terrain um, on, on foot. They're carrying whatever su meager supplies they have in their in their backpacks. You know, they're wearing Converse and cheap, um, you know, um, construction boots. And they're they're more and more walking up into the mountains where it's, it's difficult for border patrol to catch them. They're dealing with not just extreme heat and not and the, the lack of a map, the lack of a GPS, um, but they're also dealing with with intense with nature, um, with really, um, I, you know, I like to, to joke that everything in the Sonora Desert has evolved to kill you or hurt you in some way. And I'm like, you know, I, I was trained as an archaeologist. I'm supposed to like being outside. I actually hate being outside. Um, my wife's a big camper. I, camping for me is like, except for the fire, the, the campfire and the beer, I do not want to be outside. Um, and so for me with this project, having to get familiar with the desert and hiking for many, many years and hundreds of miles, and dealing with rattlesnakes and, um, and venomous uh, uh, insects and everything else was very eye-opening um, and also made it clear to me that despite all of the, the training that I had, had undertaken, having a GPS, carrying you know, 10, 10 liters of water, um, on numerous times I found myself in trouble, you know, on the verge of really hurting myself from exposure. And um, so it just gave me a, a different perspective on what, on what migrants experience who are out there with none of those um, you know, accoutrements. And as Memo and Lucho would say, like, you can mentally prepare for this, you can physically prepare for this journey, but you never know what you're going to encounter. Um, you know, this is, these guys, at, at this point in the trip, they've run out of water, they've almost died from dehydration, and then suddenly they find themselves in the midst of, of, of a monsoon. And so flash floods, and so you can drown in one of these arroyos when these flash floods happen. And I, uh, I'm always appreciative of the fact that in this moment of like trauma, these guys are out there, they're running out of water, and they're, then they're like trying to cross this rushing, rushing stream, that they stop for a minute and they go, man, I bet Jason would really love a picture of this. Let's just hold on, you know, like, and, um, I would have thrown, I, mean, I would have thrown those cameras into the water and, and said, I'm sorry, man, but, you know, but I, so, you know, but these guys really wanted me to understand this, and I think they really wanted um, all, all, of, all of you to understand this experience as well. And just how, um, you know, how intense this, this whole process is. And millions of people have gone through this in, in Arizona alone. And folks come out of this experience, you know, mentally exhausted, physically exhausted, traumatized. Um, I think there's a significant amount of PTSD that migrants experience during the migration process that goes undiagnosed. Because a lot of these folks, they come to the United States, they enter the undocumented labor force, they don't have access to adequate um, um, uh, health care, they sure as hell don't have access to adequate mental health care. And so I think that there's, you know, generations of, of folks who have, who have been um, traumatized by this, by this process. And I think it's, it, it's very, very long lasting. 
And you know the 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 saying is that if you if you don't know you have a pre-existing medical condition, you typically find out about it when you're out here in the desert pushing your body to the limit. So um, that's kind of what it looks like in the desert. And for the second half of this talk, I really wanted to to talk more about what happens to those who don't who don't make it, um, which is which is a lot of people. And so I'm just going to tell a, a couple of stories here. The Norwegian explorer Carl Lumholtz, well over a hundred years ago, he wrote that walking in the summer heat in the Sonora Desert felt like you were quote walking through great fires. But I think he's just being nice. Because at this moment that I'm out here in the desert, it feels more like we're walking through flames. It's easily over 100 degrees, and it's only 10 o'clock in the morning. I'm climbing through the Tumacacri Mountains with my longtime friend Bob Key, who's a member of the, a group called the Tucson Samaritans that leave, that leave food and water for migrants out in the desert. And he's been out there doing this for, for many, many years. He's, he has us walking on this incredibly rough path full of sharp angled rocks and angry mesquite trees that all seem to want to poke our eyes out as we're, as we're trying to make, make quick time through there. Bob keeps saying to me, we're almost there, I promise, I promise. And I just shake my head and try not to swear at him under my breath. Um, because every time in the past when Bob would say we're almost there, it was a, a white lie to make me feel better. It would be a, a euphemism for uh, four more miles to go uphill. Um, and on this particular day, um, Bob's not joking with me, which he loves to do, um, which usually involves offering to carry me on his back carry my backpack, uh, come back for me in the car. And this becomes increasingly funny when you learn that, you know, Bob is almost 30 years older than I am. Mm -hmm. I don't know what that guy eats for breakfast, but whatever it is, um, it's made him the hardiest um, uh, individual I've ever I've ever been out in the desert with. Um, but on this day, he's, he's kind of cutting me some slack because he's he's in kind of a, a more serious mood. Um, you know, it's, he's on this, this, this mission, and it's, it's clear he doesn't want to mess around. We turn a corner and we stop, and then he, he calmly says to me, this is the spot where I found the person. The sheriff came out, we took away what we, what we could find, but it was getting dark, and we didn't have enough, enough time to go over the entire area. He said, it was mostly arm and leg bones, but I want to see if we can find the head. He said, that would make it easier to identify the body. I'm sure there are still bones out here. And he's totally right. There are bones everywhere. I mean, the cops don't spend a lot of time looking for human remains out there. It's a very quick, down and dirty um, sort of survey um, that's totally unsatisfactory. So we start looking around, and, and it's it's clear that there are a lot of remains out here that, that have been um, ignored, and they're everywhere. I walk down slope, and I turn a corner, and it's one of the most just strangest and horrible things I've ever seen in my life was a, a human arm, a skeletonized arm, just sticking out between two rocks. A human arm sticking out in the middle of nowhere. Um, you know, it's been picked clean of, of, of muscle and tissue by some unknown creature, but it's clear as day, um, you know, just out there. We keep looking and we keep looking. I go up the trail and I'm looking around and I, I look on the ground and, and there's these little white flecks that stand out against the red mountain soil. And it looks like someone's dropped blackboard uh, chalk on the ground. But I get close and I realize it's not chalk. These are fragments of, of, uh, of human ribs that have been... Um, bleached by the sun and gnawed on by some some long gone animal. We keep looking, we keep looking. Up the trail, I see a human tooth laying on a rock. This is a human tooth, just in the middle of the desert. So we get desperate, we're like, okay, maybe this person's skull is here. We start looking and looking and we're digging, we're putting our hands under bushes and into holes, trying to find whatever we can, um, despite the, 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 the heat. After 45 minutes, we give up. There is no skull. We, we have we have these these few pieces of bone and a pair of shoes that that were that may or may not have been associated with this individual but where the hell is the skull I asked myself what has happened to this person all I can do is start to imagine what could have happened to this living breathing human in my mind I have this montage of, of laughing vultures that are ripping this person's eyeballs out of the sockets I hallucinate two coyotes that are batting this person's head around like a soccer ball so they can access brain matter through the, the, the form and magnum, the hole in the back of the skull. It's a moment where you despise the capacity of the human imagination. And the people that, that I've worked with over many, many years whose loved ones have disappeared, they will tell you that this is the worst part about this whole process. 
is imagining what could have happened to people that you care about. Like those are the things that will drive you insane. We start to walk away and I notice something on the ground. And I get down and it's a piece of human bone smaller than my fingernail. It immediately turns to dust. Bob has this little Ziploc bag. We start trying to put, put this piece of this person into this bag, scraping what I can off of my finger. But it's a completely futile gesture. There's very little you can do with bone dust, at least in, in this context. This person who had hopes and dreams and who loved and was loved will likely become a line in the Pima County Medical Examiner's Office. It'll become an orange tag on that wall that says name unknown, age unknown, country of origin unknown, cause of death, undetermined partial skeletal remains. The cause of death should say prevention through deterrence. When this thing happened, this, this, this encounter with this these fragments of this person, I became more and more interested in understanding what was happening to bodies out there. And so I became um, um, uh, really involved with, with thinking about decomposition and really this concept from, um, from paleontology called taphonomy, which just really refers to how um, uh, organisms decompose and the things that happen to them post postmortem. They can be cultural things, they can be environmental things. So an example of a person dies and um, we cremate them, turn them into, put them into an urn. That is a taphonomic process. It's a cultural taphonomic process. Um, if we bury them in the ground and um, and they begin to be consumed by, by insects and other microorganisms, that's also a taphonomic process. Um, and so these things happen in, in tandem, both the cultural and the biological. And I've, I wanted to understand what was happening in Arizona because nobody could give me a straight answer when I said, you know, how long do bodies take to decompose? Do animals scavenge them? If so, what kind of animals? I couldn't get any a straight answer from anybody because no one had really looked at it. And just as a, I'm going to give you a warning here, we're going to look at... Um, a couple of images of a dead animal as part of these experiments. Um, so we, we started doing um, experimental work because I was totally dissatisfied with the, um, the anecdotal things that people were saying to me about, oh yeah, you know, when someone dies in Arizona, the bodies mummify, or if they are scavenged, maybe it's bears or coyotes, but we don't really know. Um, you know, it's un you know, maybe they, they decompose over months, maybe it's, maybe it's weeks, you know, unclear. And I just found that that was not that was not helpful, and so I just kind of took a a, a a dive into the, the the world of forensic anthropology to try to understand what experiments had been done when there was no when you weren't able to use a body um, in an experiment like a, like a human body, and so for many many decades pigs have have stood in as proxies for humans um, in, in in different forensic experiments, which is what we ended up doing in Arizona. Um, and I'm happy to talk about the ethics of this either in the Q&A or, or during the reception if there's, if there's questions because, um, you know, this was not a, something we did lightly. Um, but, you know, we, um, following various other forensic experiments, we used um, um, numerous uh, um, animals, pigs in this case. Um, pigs are the preferred um, uh, animal because of a shared organ distribution with humans. It's very similar, similar skin type, similar weight. And so they've long been stand-ins for these different experiments. These animals were killed on site by a, a trained animal handler. We dressed them in clothes that we would expect migrants to wear, and we put them into and we give them personal effects, and then we, we put them into different contexts, we, in direct sunlight, in shade, and we wanted to monitor um, over the course of a field season, which was about six weeks, um, with motion sensor cameras, what what was happening. And um, in the literature that I had read about Arizona decomposition, there had been zero mention of vultures. And what we found was that 99% of the scavenging that happens in Arizona is done by, by vultures. But what was more surprising was just the speed at which these things happen. So this animal has been dead for just a few hours, and then now this is less than 72 hours. So completely defleshed. Um, um, all were left here or with the shoes that were left. That's actually how we found them. Um, a backpack. The clothing has been distributed far and wide. We actually lost quite a bit of the clothing. And probably only recovered about 35% of this particular individual. Um, so this thing happened at, at, at an incredibly rapid pace, suggesting that you know bodies out in, in the desert decompose really, really quickly. And you know much faster than anybody had ever imagined. And the fact that when the police come, they look around, you know, like a, a five foot radius, they find a, a piece of a person, you know, 
we were finding human, we were finding remains scattered for hundreds of feet um, from original point of death. Um, and some other unexpected things. Migrants have said to us that when someone dies in the group, we cover them with rocks to protect the body from scavenging. That actually has the opposite effect. Vultures need, um, need, um, need bodies to heat up to a certain temperature before they will start to scavenge. And so the ones that we covered up actually heated up much faster and were the ones that were, were most quickly um, um, uh, skeletonized and, and disarticulated. In some, in some cases, yeah, less than 48 hours from fully fleshed to ripped apart and, and distributed widely. Um, and so just a very, really troubling, troubling all, all around. And for the last part of this talk, I want to think about prevention through deterrence. I want to think about um, this, this decomposition that's happening in the desert, but I want to think about it in relationship to actual people who have gone through this process, who are, who are, who are involved in this. Um, and so I'll tell you another story. And this happened just a couple of weeks after this first, these first forensic experiments. The eight of us stand around in silent awe, and it's obvious that not every student in this group that I'm with has seen a corpse before, because someone gets close to me and whispers, is she really dead? She's lying face down in the dirt, and it appears that she has perished while attempting to get up a steep hill. To get to this point, this person has easily walked over 40 miles and had to cross through multiple mountain ranges. Rigor mortis has started to set in, and her fingers have started to curl. Her ankles are swollen to the point that it looks like her sneakers will pop off at any moment. The back of her pants are stained with excrement and bubbling with copper-colored fluids that have been expelled from her body upon death. She's been dead only a few days and is in what forensic anthropologists term early decomposition. Quote, gray to green discoloration, some flesh relatively fresh, bloating, brown to black discoloration of arms and legs. But these descriptions don't do justice to what bodies left out in the desert actually look like, smell like, or sound like. Nothing does. After several days in the sweltering summer heat, her body has begun to change. Her skin has started to blacken and mummify, and the bloating is beginning to obscure some of her physical features. While parts of her are starting to transform into unfamiliar shapes and colors, it's her striking jet black hair and the ponytail holder wrapped around her wrist that hint at, th at this person that she once was. I ask one of my students to get out a blanket and we cover her up. It makes those of us still alive feel better. In that moment, high above us, turkey vultures are already circling her corpse. I count at least four of these birds and marvel at how quickly they've gotten onto the scene. I try to ignore them. And break, you know, I try to put on my anthropology hat and say, you know, we're, we're here to document this, and so we need to do the work start writing notes, no backpack or obvious personal possessions. She's got a lone bottle of electrolyte um, that's tucked under her shoulder and under her face. We wait for hours and hours for the sheriff to come up, to come out to, to remove the body because the border patrol wants little to do with this. And the silence among us is tense. It's only broken when, uh, when a breeze comes through and rustles the branches of that mesquite tree that me and my students are sitting underneath. Out of the blue, someone starts to cry uncontrollably and is immediately consoled by a neighbor's kind embrace. Others sigh deeply. One student is so angry that she has to walk off into the distance to be alone. We sit there for what seems like an eternity as these birds continue to circle overhead. They are simultaneously implicated in, but also oblivious to the human drama that's playing out below. All these birds know is that we've disrupted their lunch plans. I want to say something to this group that will make us feel comfort or make this death seem, seem dignified or peaceful. That's a ridiculous thought. There's nothing you can say in this scenario that does not sound contrived. I, I, I just don't know what to do with this. And I think over the years, you know, as I thought about these deaths and, and just how brutal they can be and, and oftentimes seemingly incredibly undignified, I think partly like that's what this is what prevention of deterrence looks like. It's, to, it's by design. It's, it's made to do this. It's made to make these deaths um, ugly and and just traumatizing. And I think if, if I can find any form of solace in this, um, it's maybe thinking that you know that these that these individuals who are out there, um, you know, that maybe that there is dignity in in dying for people that you love dying to improve the circumstances of your family. And so maybe even against this state mechanism that has killed these people, 
that, that these bodies are pushing back and saying that we, we that that we we will we will we will fight even if it if it takes our last breath. And finally, sitting there on that dusty afternoon after hours and hours of waiting for the for the police, I turn to my students and I say, "Well, at least we got to her before the vultures did." Cuenca, Ecuador. That person, her name was Carmita Maricela Zaguipuya. She was a mother of three um, who was from Cuenca, Ecuador. And she is on that, on that wall uh, here on campus in that exhibition. Maricela left Ecuador um, to head to the United States so that she could feed her family. She'd become ill after walking several days and was abandoned by her smuggler. She probably died from a pre-existing kidney condition. And then, of course, there's the people who aren't even on this wall, who have not been found. And and I always thought that, that the things that I saw with Maricela, with that experience, that that was like the worst it could ever be in this whole thing, the loss of life. And I've, over the years, come to realize that, it's, it's, that it can always get worse. Clinical psychologist Pauline Boss has termed this phrase ambiguous loss. And it, it refers to this loss that people experience when a loved one disappears, when they, they go missing, when they're lost at sea. Um, you know, it really came out of working with families of um, soldiers missing in action during the Vietnam War, but also became important thinking about working with families of 9-11. Um, but you know, it, this has been applied to a, a variety of contexts where, where people have lost someone and they don't know whether they're alive or dead. And it keeps people in this perpetual state of grief. And I think that this, for me, is by far the worst part of this whole process, is what happens to those people who don't have a body to bury. Um, a year after we found Maricela's body, I got a, a, a message from Christina on, on Facebook, basically saying, can you help us? We have a relative who has gone missing in the desert. And so I became involved with another family um, who was looking for answers. And I went, I went to New York and Ecuador and tried to, tried to help him as much as I could. Um, this is from an interview I did with a 13-year-old kid who had been out in the desert with, with a cousin who went missing. And this kid says to me, we were in the desert for five days and the water ran out. My cousin Jose, he kept stopping to sit down and drink water, what little we had left, but he, 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 couldn't, he couldn't go on. We got to the, uh, the bottom of a hill at about 6 a.m. and he fell and, 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 and couldn't get up. He said this, the smuggler started yelling at him, telling him he needed to move, but it was clear that Jose could not. He was sitting on the ground looking dazed. So this little kid, this 13-year-old kid, he did what he could. He gave his cousin his last remaining bit of water and went to go get help. He was arrested by immigration a couple of days later, and his cousin Jose has not been found since. The kid that was left behind was 15-year-old Jose Maria Tacuri. I spent a lot of time with Jose's parents trying to figure out his last known whereabouts so that we could go look for him. Um, and his parents really wanted me to understand why their son was in the desert. So this is an interview I did with, his, with, with Jose's dad where he's explaining what has happened. And he says, when I was in Cuenca, in Ecuador, Jose, my son, he was my right hand. He was always with me. We were inseparable. But when I came to this country, my son became a rebellious child. I would call him and I would say, Jose, why have you changed? Jose was out running in the streets. He's being you know, supervised by a grandmother who couldn't keep track of the, of the kids that were, that were in the house. So he was just out kind of being wild and, and acting out. But his dad says, my, my son's response was, no, Poppy, you left me. It's your fault. We were like brothers. You were my everything and you left me. He says, it's your fault that I'm like this. He says, I told my son, look, I didn't come to New York because I wanted to be in New York. I came here because I couldn't get ahead in, in Ecuador. I couldn't give you or your siblings the things that they need working there. And Jose has a very, has a very um, special needs younger sister who, who requires a lot of care that was never going to happen on any paycheck that they were going to draw in Ecuador. His dad says, I left when my son was 10 to provide for him and my family, but he didn't understand these things at the time. We couldn't, we couldn't understand why he was acting up. 
said, why have you changed from being such a good kid? And Jose said that all he wanted to do was come to New York. But I didn't understand why. He had everything I could give him in, in, there in Ecuador. But then he just kept saying that my wife and I being gone from the house, that we were to blame, that he felt empty inside, that, we would, that he would go home and we wouldn't be there. He told me that being reunited with us would fill an emptiness inside. So after many years, they decided to send for Jose. His dad says, the last time we spoke on the phone, right before he went into the desert, he says, Papi, I need to talk to you. And I said, okay, well, tell me what's bothering you. He says, no, but I want to talk to you face to face, like father and son. It's been five years since we've seen each other. Five years since he's hugged his son. Five years since he's kissed his son. He says, okay, we'll wait until you get here. Or maybe just tell me right now. He says, no, no, I, I, I can wait. And then his dad says, you know, he never get to get to tell me what, what was wrong. But I guess he had met a girl in Ecuador and they'd gone out for six months. And they had been together before he left and she was pregnant. He wanted to know if I would help him and his soon to be born daughter. Four months after Jose disappeared, his daughter, Maria Jose, was born. And I think about this stuff. I mean, it's just like I live and breathe this. And, and I think in a lot of ways, you know, Jose, this this is the thing that both haunts me and I think it really keeps me keeps me motivated. And I think about the, the, the trauma that this family has experienced and continues to experience. And some days I wonder, you know, is Jose on that on that wall? You see one of those orange tags and and the tiny little nonprofit that I run has not been able to raise enough money to run the DNA samples on this huge backlog that we have. Maybe we've already found him and we just, and we just don't know it yet. Or maybe he'll never be found. Um, and then I think too, like the, the amount of suffering and pain that that family is going through, is just a drop in the bucket. When you look at that map of all of those orange tags. And so that's maybe the thing that, that some days I get up and I go, I don't know how we're gonna do this today how I'm going to put myself in the situation again to talk about this to try and move the ball forward just a little bit but then I tell myself too maybe if we can't if we can't find Jose maybe we can find somebody else help some other family but the thing I think that that really this whole thing that gets me is just thinking about how when I began this project, I didn't quite understand. I didn't know a lot about the world. I mean, maybe I know a little bit more about it now just because of age and, and the things that, that come with that. Um, at the time that I was interviewing his, his parents, I was a new father. Um, I had a small baby in the house. And, you know, in those days, you just kind of feel like you're just worried about getting enough sleep, not dropping the baby. I mean, just not getting poop on, whatever. There's like, you have this like kind of, these these concerns that 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 are sort of very basic in the beginning and then grow to be more more and more complex and and, and, and meaningful and I, I I know now that like the worst thing that could ever happen to me has nothing to do with me but it has to do with losing a child from my perspective that's the, that if, if I need to go to a dark place and beat myself up I worry about I think I just imagine something happening to one of my kids um, and it's the darkest place that I can take myself and sitting with Jose's parents at the time you know I'll never ever be able to shake this look that his dad gives me and I'm asking him about these things he looks at me with this sorrow that is incomprehensible um, but maybe perhaps I'm, I'm, I'm getting closer to understanding as I, as I think I become more vulnerable as a parent um, and it's his dad saying to me he's like look He's like, my son is lost, and there's nothing that I can do. I can't go down to the desert and look for him. I don't have papers. Um, like, I, like, all I can do is try to find people who can help me, but there's nothing that I can really do, and, and I feel so powerless. And he says, I'm just trying to find anyone that knows something about my son, because there's nothing that, that we can do to get the joy back that we have lost until we find him, to know something about what has happened to him. 
He says, every day that passes, I feel more and more out of control. To lose my son like this and not know what has happened is going to make us cry for the rest of our lives. He says, it feels like I'm losing a battle. But then I, I try to wake up every day and I, with energy and I tell myself, we're going to find him, we're going to find him. But it's so difficult to live like this, he says, to know nothing. And then he says, I just pray to God that we'll be somehow reunited with Jose in one form or another. Thank you. I know we're supposed to end at one, right? So we are. The stream will probably finish on YouTube now, but if, I think if people wanted to stay, let's stick around and maybe ask some questions. We can do that. If anyone has any questions, has the exhibit been shown in Washington, D.C.? We had a show at the Corcoran Museum, mm -hmm. um, but it happened like mid pandemic, and so I, you know, I feel like, you know, yeah, um, we're hoping to do it again. I mean, I would love to do a pop up version on them. I mean, one of the things that we thought about, you know, We've been collecting all of the tags that people fill out in all these places, and it's over it's over 600,000 tags right now, and one idea was to take all of those tags and then just drop them on the mall, mm -hmm. do some kind of thing to bring it, to bring it back. And I don't know if that's, if that's ever going to happen, but we, we're definitely accumulating those things, but trying to find ways to bring this to Washington. That, um, um, but yeah, if anyone has any ideas, we'd love to hear it, but it'd be great to do that. Um, I just had a quick technical question, methodology of doing your research. When you were uh, documenting the two individuals who crossed through the desert, um, you obviously didn't do it with them, but you were following their track and gave them the camera equipment and all that. Did that not put you at risk with uh, the Border Patrol and immigration authorities you know at the time um you know over the years it's become really clear that the border patrol has like zero interest in this work you know like when i talk to agents about it they're like yeah we kind of know that or we don't really care um i did a in, in 2016 i met a high-ranking official at that um Customs and Border Protection, who ended up becoming the, like, under Trump, becoming the, like, top cop. Um, and he gave me all this access to the Border Patrol. And so I went and I had all these meetings with guys who would say things to me like, I don't like you or your politics. But my boss apparently likes you, so i got to do whatever you want. What do you want to see? And so they gave me all this access. And, um, you know, we, we talked about what I, what I had been doing, and they were so disinterested. All they wanted to know about was the smuggling stuff that I was looking at. And, and, and that was more from like a, a curiosity standpoint, like are they really as crazy as we think they are kind of thing. Um, but they had no interest in the data. I mean, when we, and we've always tried to um, uh, present the, the information in a, in a, at a resolution that's not, that you couldn't like go and find one of these archeological sites. Um, I will say at the time when we, when we did the, the Arizona stuff, there was no discussion about facial recognition software. And so, um, you know, I think if I was doing this project today, you wouldn't be seeing those those kinds of pictures. Um, thankfully, th those two guys have zero internet presence. I mean, it's just like, they're like, what's a Facebook kind of thing? So, you know, but a lot of the people I work with now, especially with the smugglers, they're all on Facebook. Um, they all have, you know, some of them have profiles that say occupation smuggler, and I'm like, <laughs> like, 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 dude, please. Um, but if you go on, on TikTok, I mean, I have a student right now undergrad who's doing a, a like a, a thesis in digital humanities on this archive on TikTok of people crossing the border. It's all of these like selfies and just there's this huge, huge network of, of, of communication that, that's happening and this really rich data sets around these experiences. But it's people like, I mean, fit, really putting themselves and putting themselves out there, which oftentimes makes me, you know, makes me quite worried. Um, but yeah, in the beginning when we were very concerned about, about Border Patrol and it was mostly, I mean, with my interactions with them um, are mostly either just harassment on a general level because I'm brown and I'm driving around Arizona, 
but very little interest in the actual research. I mean, it, re it would require reading a book, and I think a lot of those guys like this is not a book that they want to dive into <laughs> or even read. I mean, I'm not saying that they're all, but you know, um, but yeah, that was a big a big concern in Arizona for a while. Thank you. You know, the great irony of all of this, and it's, it should be answered politically, is they need us. Migrant needs us to come here to live better, but we need them also. Yep. Yeah. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. If we didn't have the migrant, undocumented workers in the United States, we'd be paying $10, $15 for a gallon of milk, uh, $10 for a piece of romaine lettuce, Mm -hmm. I was just going to ask you if there's been any, um, in a positive way, um, picking up on your scholarship and, and this project for uh, improvement in policies. Like, have you seen, uh, you know, positive reactions in a policy form? Yeah, I mean, you know, we've, uh, the, the idea has really been to like, can we give this information to the general public in ways that's sort of digestible, comprehensible, and then what can they do with that? And so we've seen like people, even around the exhibition, lots of campaign, you know, letter writing to politicians and that kind of stuff, um, town halls. Um, so there has been like, you know, sort of small things. I feel, I feel like as an anthropologist, I'm a really bad policy. Like I could never work in policy because they don't like our, the responses are, well, it's really complex. And then let me make it more complicated for you by adding a whole bunch of other variables that maybe you weren't thinking about. Mm -hmm. I think people get, you know, we we often turn off policymakers. And actually, the new book that I just finished, there's a whole thing about like, you know, well, how do we fix smuggling? For me, it's like, oh well, we fix capitalism, right? <laughs> we start with that, and it's like, well, that, you know, well, I, I can't put that on a campaign slogan, you know. Um, yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, but. With Colibri, I mean, we did for a while, we, we did have someone who was working more actively with, with, with policy sorts of stuff, and we may go back to it, but um, I think it's probably more around, like, I think immigration reform, and, like, making those kinds of recommendations is probably out of my, my sort of realm, but I think there are other policy things that we can do on a, on a smaller scale that could be helpful, especially thinking about just repatriation of remains. Um, even for me, like, a big policy push that we want to make is a lot of, like, we don't have any access to federal databases for missing, like NamUs or missing person stuff, or even the Border Patrol's um, database of people they've apprehended. We can't, if we have missing a, a missing person's file and we have DNA, we can't submit it to them to run a comparison. Um, occasionally, the medical examiner will be allowed to do that. We just had a case recently that was closed after maybe eight or nine years where finally they let the medical examiner submit a DNA sample to the database and then they had an immediate match because they had caught this person eight years ago, they had his DNA on file and that, and that solved that case you know, within a matter of hours. Um, but, but we have zero ability to do that. And so for me, like if, if pushing for, for policy changes, it's kind of on that level. It feels a little bit more manageable at least. I think we got time for one last question. Um, in the book you talk about how the US government really turns the environment into a killing technology. But that was a really interesting, um, that was really eye-opening to me, and also the eco side, right, the violence against the land that is required. Um, so can you just talk about environment as killing technology? Yeah, I mean, I think the environment is, is the most effective and cheapest em employee of the federal government. I mean, the desert does the desert does all of this work. It kills people, and then it it destroys the evidence. Um, and w we're increasingly seeing that happening on a global scale. And you know, it's a uh, it's it's this thing. I mean, and, and the, it's part of this larger, I think, movement to find ways to. Um, it's like to like smile while I'm like you know sort of stabbing you. Um, you know, the, the federal government has has manipulated all kinds of the language we use to talk about it. Um, you know, there was a, a, a program for a long time called the Alien Transfer and Exit Program, ATEP. And it, it really was if you migrate, if you get caught in San Diego, they would arrest you and deport you to the Sonoran Desert in Mexico. Mm -hmm. right. And then they would say that, oh, we're deporting you to, to far away to separate you from your dangerous human smuggler that's going to force you to cross the border again. So it's for your own good, even though we know that 
people who are migrating with a smuggler typically have gone to great lengths to find someone that, that's relatively trustworthy. They've, they've contacted someone from their own community who might rip them off, but at least if, if something bad happens to them, they're, they're somewhat accountable because we, we know where they, they live, you know, they're part of this community. By separating them from those smugglers, putting them in the desert, now you don't have that person anymore. Now you have to contract a new smuggler. Or maybe you go into the desert because it, now you're, you're within proximity of that, and that's the easiest kind of next step. Um, and so it's, it's, it's putting, the, the, putting nature into these um, social interactions in really kind of savvy ways that then at the same time people can say, well, we didn't do it. You know, you got bit by a rattlesnake in the desert. You died from dehydration. How is that the federal government's fault? Even though this policy is, is clearly structured to do that. And, you know, the, the newest kind of big move that the U.S. has done starting in 2014 is a program called um, Plan Frontera Sur, which is me a Mexican immigration policy that has been supported by the U.S. Um, and I know that because I've spent time in, the, in Mexico with U.S. Border Patrol agents who are training Mexican immigration agents. I've spent time in Honduras with U.S. Border Patrol agents who are training people there to catch their citizens before they can leave the country. And what it's done to Mexico is, you know, it used to be you could cross Mexico in a couple of weeks, you get on top of the train or whatever, or you could, you could take a bus, and there wasn't a lot of security. Now with all of this, like, crackdown, people have to walk through these jungles, they're being assaulted, robbed, murdered by organized crime, they're being more heavily taxed. And so there's all these human rights violations happening and, and, and horrible things happening in the jungle. And the U.S. can say, well, we, that's Mexico. Mexico's corrupt. And there's all these horrible things happening there. Like, we didn't do that, even though the U.S. is throwing money at this, at this thing, is encouraging, you know, all of these, all of these policies. Um, but it's just a way to say, like, you know, out of sight, out of mind. Um, but we're seeing this happen on a global scale now, too. And um, whether it's Australia, um, you know, the Darien Gap, Mediterranean, I mean, it's, you know, Belarus. I mean, it's just, it's, it's in a million places right now, and nature is playing an increasingly important role. Well, unfortunately, I think we are definitely out of time now. Um, can you all join me in thanking Professor Delia? <laughs>